Today's speakers are Nikunj Patel, Matt Harwood, and, and Oliver Hatley. Nikunj is a principal scientist in Sertara's modeling and simulation group. He led the development of the physiologically based IVIVC module of the SimSIP simulator and the pharmaceutics module of the SimSIP in vitro analysis platform. Matt Harwood is also is a senior research scientist at Sertara. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in physiology and human nutrition from the University of Sheffield and his doctorate from the University of Manchester. Oliver Hatley is a senior research scientist who obtained his PhD from the Center for Applied Pharmacokinetic Research at the University of Manchester. Nikunj, Matt, and Ollie, welcome to today's event. I'll now turn it over to Ollie to, to begin today's presentation. So um, basically what I'm going to do now is just give you a brief overview of the new SIM cancer population, which is in version 17 of the SimSIP simulator. Just before I go on to that, I just wanted to highlight that um, in the simula simulator we have um, 19 um, populations available to us. And, and kind of the reason why we, we, we do this obviously is to try and look at uh, predictions of exposure in different populations. And obviously, we know that there are differences, for example, in ethnicities, which result um, from differences in demographics and physiological changes between populations. In disease states, uh, often routes of elimination are inhibited, and this can affect dosage regimens in uh, disease subjects. And also, if we think about pediatric populations, for example, there are age-dependent changes um, which um, affect the, the dosage um, across different age groups. In version 17, we've been introduced three different uh, populations um, in, uh, in version 17. This includes a preterm population. Uh, Nikunj is going to mention briefly later on about the psoriasis population, and I'm going to talk to you about the cancer population in version 17. Why as a community are we interested in developing a PPK model for cancer? Obviously, um, what we find is that there's accelerated drug approval um, for oncology drugs, and also we have to take into account the mechanism of action, which often precludes a lot of healthy volunteer trials. And essentially what we want to do at an earlier stage is try and get a mechanistic understanding of uh, the exposure in a cancer population. And, and how we do that is take into account the, the demographics and also the physiological changes uh, unique to this population. Also uh, for consideration is the fact that often uh, cancer patients have different comorbidities and therefore they'll have um, different uh, medications to, uh, to treat this. And also we have to take into account as well the fact that uh, there may be um, treatments to, to treat uh, side effects. So all these contribute to an increased risk of drug-drug uh, interactions. Finally, a useful feature, obviously, is if we're able to predict well the systemic concentration as well as organ concentrations, it provides a useful uh, platform for investigating uh, tumor distribution and therefore uh, impact uh, on treatment regimens. I'm just listing here um, uh, three different publications, and, and these are from uh, consortium members who have who've developed um, uh, PBBK cancer populations in SimSIP. I'd, I'd like to obviously thank um, uh, Sanofi and Genetech who, who have also provided data to us for uh, developing our own PBBK uh, cancer population, uh, and basically that it highlights the, the strength of our uh, consortium membership in terms of uh, collaborating in research. And obviously, we've used this data for not only building the population along with other uh, published references, in, but also for independent verification. We're just going to have a poll now, um, which uh, we'll switch to, which will just 
uh, allow us to look at um, what oncology programs you're interested or working in. And if you could just um, submit any uh, answers to that. Um, we've got a few uh, options available, um, you know, breast cancer, lung cancer, correctal, skin, uh, leukemia, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and any other cancer. So to remind our audience, um, to participate in polling, you can either use a second screen or you can use your smartphone. Go to the website www.menti.com and then enter the, the six-digit code 535643. And for each question, uh, enter your response and then hit submit. And um, Ollie will speak to the answer in just one moment. Thanks to all those who, uh, who took part. Um, I w we'll assess those at the end, but I think it really goes to show that there's quite a range of, of different cancers um, people are, are looking at. It's just returned to the site, slides now. So um, yeah, on the back of that, um, I just wanted to highlight the, the application of the, the SIMSIP um, cancer population. So when, when we put this together, um, our focus was on solid tumor types. Um, in terms of um, com comorbidities, as I've mentioned, we tried to exclude that data where possible. The, the data for untreated cancer pa patients is is very limited, and hence uh, treated pa patient data was often included. The base population was the SIM North European Caucasian population, so that was so is something that I, would, I really wanted to highlight that this essentially is a population uh, to re represent um, cancer in Caucasian patients. And obviously, what we did, we we um, verified, and I'll show in the next uh, slide. Um, how we verified the parameters which were unique to the, the SIM cancer population um, and those which were common with the North European Caucasian. And finally, more related to, to the uh, poll there, that is, is, it is designed to be a generic population um, looking at the general features of cancer. And the ideal um, scenario is to um, tailor this population for specific cancer types. So if we just go on to the, the physi physiology and, and some of the uh, performance verification that we did with the, the SIM cancer population. So this is predominantly a, a disease of um, older age and therefore within the simulator we, we changed um, some of the inputs and added in uh, user-defined age distribution, which allowed us to capture uh, more accurately this distribution of patients. We looked at uh, male age height relationships, and in this case, um, the North European Caucasian relationship as expected, because that was the base and um, our target population, and that seemed to work well for describing um, the, the simulated and individual data. We looked at height uh, body 
weight relationships. And uh, obviously one of the key features in cancer is a reduction in body weight. So uh, we used a cancer-specific um, relationship between height and body weight. Also related to, to changes in body mass is the reduction in, in muscle, and that leads to increases in serum creatinine. So um, we were able to um, capture um, data on the serum creatinine levels in cancer patients and um, be able to simulate those out. One of the, the caveats um, in the cancer population is that the traditional methods for prediction of GFR, so this includes the cockroach gulp or the modified diet in renal disease, these GFR models um, have poorer prediction accuracy in the cancer patients. So we introduced in version 17 the lower scripting function, and this allowed us to incorporate um, uh, a right form formula, which was uh, used for prediction of GFR, and this adequately predicted um, GFR for cancer uh, patients. Also, there were changes in uh, blood and plasma uh, proteins. So. Uh, what is characteristic in cancer is a reduction in albumin concentrations and an increase in alpha acid glycoprotein. And what we did, we, we collected a number of sources um, of, of data and were able to um, simulate these out and also capture the, the individual data. And finally, just to mention, um, in in a publication in, in 2016, um, there was a database of hepatic abundances which were compiled for um, healthy uh, Caucasians. But as part of this work, they collected data also from um, cancer patients. Um, and this uh, literature data was, was used in order to look at relationships between cancer and, and healthy volunteers are in different hepatic transporters. And, and what we observed is that there, there was increase in uh, abundance for O2E1B1 and the reductions in, in other uh, hepatic transporters such as 2B1, whilst other um, hepatic expressed uh, transporters had a relatively no change versus North European Caucasian data. So these are all incorporated within the, the sim cancer population. Just to highlight the, the key features again, so we use the user-defined age distribution to describe that older population. The right formula for a GFR prediction was provided via Lewis scripting, and this is related to the increased serum creatinine observed. There are changes in plasma volume and also plasma proteins. We've included the hepatic transporter abundance. And also on the back of looking at enzyme abundances, so we looked obviously um, in a similar way at enzyme abundances. Um, the, the data that, provide, uh, that we found was conflicting in terms of the effect of cancer on enzyme abundances. And also I'll go on to talk about the performance verification for um, uh, SIP substrates. And, and demonstrate to you why we decided not to correct enzyme abundances. So this performance verification was done using default SIMSIP substrates. In, in total, we had eight substrates covering a, a range of SIP um, metabolism and also um, a PGP substrate. And essentially, we were looking at uh, simulations in the version 17 SIM cancer population uh, at and matching study designs, including age and sex, and looking at the prediction accuracy uh, to observe clinical data, and also the comparison to healthy volunteer trial observations as well as simulations. Just want to pick up on, on these differences between cancer and healthy. Um, obviously, um, it, it's been well documented that there, there seems to be uh, in so, several studies, um, a reference to the fact there's a decrease in clearance in cancer. When we performed the performance verification for our cancer population, we didn't see that we needed to change SIP abundances. 
And partly this is reflected in the fact that healthy clinical trials, healthy volunteer studies, are often much younger and the age of uh, cancer patients is obviously much older. And when we've incorporated the uh, physiological changes, which um, are characteristic of, of older populations, um, principally looking at the changes in liver volume, for example, you already get that change in, in SIP abundance between the two populations. Finally, at the bottom, what, what we're just showing here is um, AUC ratio from cancer to healthy and also clearance ratios in cancer to healthy, looking at both observed ratios and simulated ratios. And, and what we observed was that we could do a reasonable job at predicting these ratios, but just to notice as well that some compounds have very high variability, so it can impact your, your decisions when looking at the fold difference from the, the clinically observed studies. Just to summarize then, uh, we've established um, a, a generic sim cancer population for simulating drug, drug dis disposition in cancer patients. We've looked at performance verification of both the physiological parameters as well as pharmacokinetic uh, verification. And finally, um, just to mention in the future, so there's a version 18 uh, wish list item looking at tumor distribution of both small and large molecules, and, and this population will form a basis um, for this work. So that just concludes uh, my work. I'm just going to pass on to Nikunj now, who's going to talk about the skin model. Okay. Thank you very much, Oli. Um, in terms of the skin model in version 17, uh, we introduced uh, quite a wide variety of features. Um, for the people, uh, just for the knowledge, this, uh, the skin model was developed as part of a grant, research grant we received from uh, FDA, uh, which was a multi-year project and we are in the last year. However, the views presented here are my own and they are not um, regulatory policies or endorsement. Um, so I think on this slide is um, is a pictorial representation of what uh, the model uh, is in the background along with some of the parameters that are uh, supported or that are used during the simulation. Uh, so the very first compartment is the surface of the skin where you can apply different formulations. I think we cover majority of the topical and transdermal uh, drug product formulations, for example, gels, creams, paste ointments and, and, and patches, and there are multiple options to account for that. Uh, on the surface of the skin, we already account for the number of hair follicles, the size of hair follicle, and, and any effect of gender, age on hair follicle, and, and obviously the pH of the skin surface. Um, some of the formulations could modify the pH, and that is already accounted for, so you can basically account for the effect of the formulation on the surface skin pH. But the pH on the skin surface would decide how much drug is ionized or unionized. By default, unionized drug can go through these lipidic channels uh, in the um, brick and mortar structure of the skin. So the bricks are basically a corneocyte, and uh, the mortar is composed of the lipid uh, or the fused lipids. And basically, the lipophilic drug typically goes via this uh, tortuous pathway, and that is one of the rate limiting steps. However, the model automatically decides if the drug goes via this intercellular lipidic pathway or intracellular pathway, uh, depending on the hydrophilicity, lipophilicity, and molecular weight of the compound. Uh, once inside the corneocyte, the drug can get absorbed on the keratin, and that could basically serve as a depot. There are uh, steroids that are known to act as a depot, so after, even after removal of formulation from the skin surface, the drug can still be absorbed. Um, once it passes through the stratum corneum, it goes via viable epidermis to dermis and uh, to the deeper layers. Uh, within viable epidermis and dermis, we have uh, provided ability to uh, consider the metabolism of the drug um, uh, while it is getting absorbed. 
the dermis, subcutis, and uh, deep compartment, which is uh, mainly muscle at the moment, but that can be modified to account for any other um, regions or, or another sub subdermal layer, for example, um, uh, synovial fluid. Uh, but they have their own blood flow and they are basically predicted based on the cardiac output and body surface area. Um, and these are some of the parameters that are part of the model and I think the team has or uh, has spent huge amount of effort to collect all this information and provide database. So by default we have healthy North European Caucasian population where we account for the gender effect where possible. Uh, my colleague Farzani, I think she'll spend a lot of time understanding how the skin physiology matures from birth up to adulthood. And we have these ontogenic functions of skin physiology as part of the simulator. However, if you have any more information, you could modify the default values. Uh, we, in version 17, I'm going to come back to it, but we provide elderly population, ethnic group, and disease population, which is psoriasis. And as I mentioned that overall it was a huge amount of effort to conduct this meta-analysis of understanding the skin physiology where we looked at around 350 clinical studies and tried to derive 100 plus parameter values. And overall uh, it was more than two person year effort that was spent on understanding, collecting and analyzing the skin physiology data to support this model. Um, so just to briefly mention what we have added in the model for version 17 is that we allow now uh, handling of vehicle operation. So basically for gels and uh, formulations containing alcohol or hydroalcoholic solutions, uh, the evaporation of vehicle is very important for the accurate prediction of the absorption from formulation. So that will be that is provided in version 17. Uh, there are first order or zero order models you can use. Um, we also added subdermis diffusion compartments, so subcutis and muscle, and I think again it was a huge effort because we already account for the eight different locations of human body. For example, subcutis on uh, face versus thigh would be significantly different, and it will be different between male and female. Uh, uh, and similarly, the muscle. So the muscle in different parts of body is 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 very different in terms of thickness, in terms of physiology, and in terms of the. Um, 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 the physical characteristic. So where possible, we try to account for the, this information in the model. Also, uh, we have done a huge work in uh, characterizing the skin physiology in psoriasis, and my colleague Fred, I think he spent a lot of time, and we are currently undergoing uh, performance verification of the model and should be available very soon. Uh, pediatric skin is available from birth up to adulthood, and also we uh, we have provided connection between PK and PD. So basically, the local skin concentrations could be connected to the PD to simulate any response of interest. Uh, we also added geriatric skin physiology and and gender effect where possible. I think it was not possible to differentiate between Korean, Japanese, and Chinese population. So I think we basically have a common so population called Asian, where we, we basically combine the data from Korean, Japanese, and Chinese physiology. Um, you could run up to four simultaneous drug absorption. So you could run substrate inhibitor one, two, and three in dermal, or you could combine with dermal and oral and IV. So it's quite flexible in terms of how you want to simulate. Um, and and uh, for different purposes, and it actually is being now used uh, by uh, um, many of the consortium members, and I'll come back to it. But before we go there, there is a poll question, if we can uh, go there. Um, so as you have seen that we have already done quite a, a good amount of work, uh, but still uh, we are trying to extend the work or, or the model. So some of these features are already collected by interaction with individuals, but we would probably want to add excipient effect on the skin penetration because at the moment we do not have any effect of excipient on skin physiology that in turn could have a significant influence on absorption. Uh, the second feature which might be of interest is the acne skin physiology because acne is one of the um, uh, big uh, disease area for the skin. Uh, third feature is the in vitro permeation experiment. So can, can we allow modeling of in vitro experiments to get the key parameter to improve the prediction? 
the fourth feature is the addition of lymphatic absorption because at the moment the only absorption from skin is via blood, but that could be possibility of having lymphatic absorption pathway. And obviously the fourth option is uh, additional formulation options like microneedles and uh, ion 2 forases and uh, other um, uh, fancy formulation options. So I'm, I'm going to give you some more time to uh, uh, provide your feed, uh, inputs, and then probably either now or maybe in the end we could we could summarize the interest. Okay, I think in interest of time, we can move back to presentation, but please give your inputs, and I think we could uh, revisit it in the end. Um, so I think the next big step is that we have developed uh, um, a skin model, which is really uh, quite detailed in terms of physiology and formulation. So the next question is that, um, how predictive it is, and I think this is one of, one of the questions, and I think we are conducting a quite thorough performance verification. As you can see, we are looking at around 12 different compounds of different natures. So we are covering uh, neutral compound, for example, compound X here, which I cannot disclose, or acids, for example, diclofenac, ibuprofen, and some of the basic compounds, for example, buprenorphine, oxybutynin, and uh, some of the zwitterines like acyclovir or, or some of the amphalides. Um, we are also covering quite a wide range of lipophilicity from very hydrophilic compounds like caffeine to uh, something which is very uh, lipophilic and also different uh, binding characteristics. We are also looking at the transdermal formulations like patches and topical formulations like gels and creams where uh, the target site is local. Uh, uh, we are also trying to understand if we can predict the exposure by dermal absorption within different populations like pediatrics, psoriasis, etc. And the uh, other aim is to conduct virtual bioequivalence. For example, if we can really recover the formulation differences and, and, uh, and can inform um, the bioequivalence assessment of uh, different formulations. So just to give you an example, um, this is a case study one where basically one of my colleagues, Tariq, uh, he used the model to see if we can really predict the, uh, ro the impact of site of application. So as I mentioned, in the model by default, we collected how the physiology of face is different than forearm versus thigh or lower leg, and that is already provided. So he used the default locations and tried to simulate the uh, Riva stigmine patches, and I think uh, there was clinical data available. We were able to recover reasonably well the, the, the exposure when the same patch was applied on different anatomical locations of the body. Uh, and this is uh, one of the good performance verifications, so it doesn't allow only the effect of patch, but also different uh, anatomical locations. Uh, the second case study is basically uh, looking at if we can recover the formulation differences for the same compound. So this is ibuprofen, and I think we are trying to simulate ointment versus cream versus gel. You could potentially compare two different cream formulations if you have information, um, and then try to see um, if the model uh, predicts. The second big aspect, as I already mentioned, that you could also simulate the population variability and dermal pop formulations are quite well known for the significantly high variability, and it will be important to know individual subject exposure. Maybe the subject at the top range may be, uh, um, there may be an issue with the safety, et cetera. So basically it allows you to account for the population variability. Uh, the most important is that it allows you to identify clinically relevant critical product quality attributes. For example, for this formulation, the viscosity of the formulation is very important, affecting the AUC. But if you look at the pH of the formulation, there is not much of an effect on the exposure. Uh, 
So maybe during manufacturing, uh, the viscosity may need to be tightly controlled as compared to pH. Uh, and also it allows you to understand the impact of some of the physiological parameters like tortuosity of the stratum corneum pathway. Um, and uh, that's basically uh, it, and I think we are in the process of writing it up as a series of publications uh, because that's the ultimate, game, uh, ultimate aim of the research grant from FTA. So in, in, the next few, in, in the next year, there might be more publications coming out and, and uh, would become available for um, um, a wider audience. Uh, if you have any questions, you could start typing into the Q&A, and I think we will come back to it in the end. So uh, um, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Matt, and he's going to take you through what we did for transporters. Okay, thank you for that, Nikun. So this is the, uh, the final presentation of the three. And I will be discussing the expansion of gut transport as an IV-IVE techniques in the ADAM and M-ADAM models. So over the last 10 to 15 years, the importance of drug transporters has certainly come to the fore in respect to looking at drug absorption, distribution into various tissues, uh, and in particular, uh, DDIs. This particular paper here that was published in 2016 by PAN and colleagues uh, is an FDA paper, and it highlights uh, some of the regulatory submissions to that date uh, in respect to uh, transporters for certain NDAs. So in this relatively short paper, they summarize these, and they give four particular examples here. You can go and read the paper for more details. But it basically highlights that um, they have utilized uh, SIMSIP PBPK submissions to inform drug labels. Uh, a paper published, uh, again, based out of the FDA from 2015 by Wagner et al. Um, they also provided a nice commentary on the FDA's perspective on the prediction of uh, various DDIs, not only transporter, but uh, metabolic DDIs. And I've just taken this snippet from a, a table from that paper in respect to the transporter-mediated DDIs. And in a nutshell, the FDA opinion on the current status is that uh, the in vitro and vivo extrapolation is not mature enough due to an inadequate body of information. And the predictive performance of IVIV is yet to be adequately demonstrated, although obviously in the follow-up paper in 2016, they do uh, take submissions for the transporters. And it's quite nice that there was additional points from industry added here in which the scaling factors were um, particularly poorly understood in respect to um, uh, scaling for IVIVE. So in light of these kind of findings, the consortium were keen to improve their mechanistic understanding of transporter function uh, for improving IVIV predictability um, for transporter-mediated disposition and DDI. So uh, just to give you an overview um, of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about the expansion of the ADAM and M-ADAM models to include additional transporters. I'm going to provide some of the algorithms and the concepts um, to scale uh, transporters' uh, functionality via absolute abundances. And I will give a very brief appraisal of the intestinal transporter absolute and relative expression analysis uh, that went hand in hand with this particular project. So this schematic here shows uh, an enterocyte cell. We have the apical brush border membrane on the left and the basolateral membrane on the right. And as you can see here, any transporter that is colored with green text is new for version 17. So you can see that there has been a substantial increase in the number of transporters within this version. Uh, we've had uh, quite an increase in the number of named apical uptake transporters, as you can see here. So, for example, we've included OATP2B1, which is known to transport statins, sulfasalazine. PET-T1 uh, is a peptide transporter and is um, often utilized as a prodrug target. So, osteltamivir, valacyclovir, for example. On the basal lateral membrane, we've added the MRPs. So MRP1, 3, and 4, which have been implicated for um, methotrexate, uh, retrovirals, and oncolo oncologic uh, drugs. And we've also added in OATP4C1, which um, has been implicated in the transport of uh, digoxin. 
Placed within the centre of the cell are three endogenous or more endogenous associated transporters. So we have the ileal bilateral transporter, OST alpha beta, and GLUT2. Some of these transporters have been implicated in um, drug transport specifically. For, so, for example, OST alpha beta is um, it may well uh, transport digoxin, um, but some of these are included because they are targets for um, uh, drug discovery. Um, uh, settings. So in terms of uh, the way we scale uh, our transporters, so for many years we've actually uh, scaled via a relative uh, uh, abundance or expression uh, approach where uh, if you go and look at these papers here from 2009 to 2013 you'll get a better understanding of what we do exactly. But essentially we are utilising mRNA uh, um, Western blotting type data in which you can't get an absolute value because you don't have the required standards to do so to obtain a regional expression that is normalized to the Jejunum 1. So for example, for PGP, Jejunum 1 has an average value of 1 in a population and the average value in the ileum is about 50% higher as shown by these darker colors. This is um, in contrast to the way we scale for the SIP450, so for the last dozen years or so we, we have had absolute abundances for, for um, P450s in the gut and we do therefore scale via peak and mole absolute abundances for each individual in each segment for these particular metabolic components. So absolute abundance data um, are um, becoming available uh, more and more over the last five to six years in the intestine. So we actually harness some of that data for our meta-analyses. So in terms of the first option, which we've had in uh, for about 10 years now, the relative uh, scaling approach for transporters, what the user needs to do is generate a JMAX and KM. They then correct that for their filter surface area of their trans well. <laughs> There is a scaling factor which bridges any mechanistic uh, gap in terms of activity or expression for a given transporter between the in vitro and the in vivo system. So we term this in the simulator the relative expression factor, which is typically a unitless scalar that um, relies on the in vivo divided by the in vitro abundance for a particular transporter. We can scale um, then through the various segments according to the relative expression as I showed briefly on the previous slide for a given transporter and we have a CV associated with each transporter. You can read more about this approach and the verification utilizing this approach in this paper here from 2013 from our colleague Sibylla Neuhoff. So in terms of the new approach that we've incorporated for version 17, option two is an absolute abundance or ICFT scaling approach. So what the user will need to do in this instance is think about the way that they actually assign units into the simulator. So the user still needs to measure a JMAX and KM, but they also need to measure the absolute abundance of the transporters across their filter uh, monolayer. And then they correct their JMAX for the absolute abundance. You can then scale again via a scaling factor. It's not the ref in this instance, it's an ICFT and I'll talk about this lower down the slide. And then we scale for the, uh, rep, the absolute abundance in each given segment, um, which is extrapolated out in picomoles per milligram of protein. And I'll show you how that works in algorithmic form in the following slide. So for equation one, the way we deal with the intrinsic clearance in vitro, we have a JMAX input, so the user needs to input picomole per min per picomole of transporter across that monolayer. It's michaelis menten so it's saturable. We have the KM and the relative driving, relevant driving concentration. And then we multiply out by our, our scaling factor, ICFT, which is basically, again, another unitless scalar, and it corrects for the in vivo to in vitro differences in the activity per picomole of transporter. I don't have time to go into all the details here, but if you have any questions, then I can deal with that. Um, if you want to go and read this review paper, that has details too. So at this point, I think we'll move into a poll. Uh, so we'll go back to Menti, and um, 
the question we have here is, is, is really quite simple compared to the others. There's only two options. And I'm really interested in uh, understanding whether you guys are measuring your absolute transporter abundances uh, in, your, in your transporter assay systems, because um, if you're not doing that, then you're not going to be able to utilize this kind of approach. So we'll just give you a minute to fill this out. Okay, it looks like uh, polling has pretty much come to a standstill now. Thank you for all your responses. So it looks like around about um, sort of 25 to 30 percent of you guys are measuring that, which is actually a higher number than I thought we were going to get. Okay, so let's just move on and, and, and um, finish off the uh, the ICFT algorithm. So I've just shown you the in vitro. Um, uh, part of the algorithm where you're defining your Michaelis menten and correcting for peak mole of transporter abundance. We then need to take this to the in vivo setting. So equation two uh, principally deals with the proximal jejunum. This is our reference segment, so it is in actually the, the, the simplest algorithm we have. And well, there looks like a little bit of a formatting issue here, but it's not too much of a problem. So we transfer the result of equation one into equation two, and you simply multiply this value out by the proximal jejunum absolute abundance for a given individual. And that is actually obtained by um, the absolute abundance in picomoles per milligram of total membrane protein for a given transporter. And we obtain those values, and we put those values on screen from uh, literature meta-analyses. And then you multiply that out by the membrane protein yield in, um, in the jejunum one in milligrams. So this is a similar kind of scalar to a microsomal protein, has a slightly different value in this instance here. And again, that comes from actually fairly sparse data, but there is some data available which we can uh, utilize within the simulator. A slightly more complex case is for other small intestinal segments that are not references. So for example, for the duodenum. We utilize the proximal jejunum abundance on screen, and you can multiply out by the membrane protein yield for the duodenum, for example, in this instance. And the relative segmental uh, abundance then needs to be applied as a unit of scalar. So for example, for PGP, duodenal abundance is about 50% of that uh, in the then versus in the jejunum one. So this value would be 0 0.5, and you can downscale the importance of the absolute abundance here. So in terms of the meta-analysis, just a really brief appraisal here. It was actually quite a huge task to do this. We did it for uh, healthy Caucasians, and we looked at relative and absolute expression. In terms of the relative expression, this is principally focusing in on RT-PCR and Western blotting type data. And for the absolute expression, that mainly focused in on uh, tandem mass spectrometry, so quantitative targeted proteomics generally. Uh, there was one study that had um, that utilized Western blotting um, that we could obtain absolute abundances for. The final database had greater than 1,750 transporter measurements with 14 transporters included. So in this pie chart here, this really just shows the, um, the, the, the abundances that we simulate in, in 2,000 virtual Caucasians on the basis of this meta-analysis. And as you can see here, the greatest proportion of the pie chart is taken up with PET-T1. So this is easily the most abundant transporter that we focused in on. Second most abundant was MRP2. Least abundant here was the ileal bile acid transporter, which actually um, goes, uh, goes with the physiology and the expected outcome for this particular transporter, because it's much more highly expressed in the terminal ileum than in the uh, proximal regions of the small intestine. So just a little snapshot of the regional expression. I've taken OATP2B1 here. So we have the normalized expression to the jejunum one 
for all of our segments in the ADAM and the M-ADAM models. And as you can see here, this is, uh, you can see a relatively uniform regional expression for OATP2B1. And the relative and absolute approaches uh, were actually combined and then incorporated into the simulator for this particular transporter. So, summary in future, this project offers um, the ability to assess the impact of up to 20 gut transporters on drug absorption and DDI. Um, you can uh, look at a mechanistic IV-IV approach using gut transporter absolute abundance while also retaining a relative approach, i.e. the option one I showed earlier. Um, I'm hoping in the future we'll uh, be able to uh, look at um, advancing gut transporter IVIVE, understanding transporters in terms of activity per picomol, um, which will obviously facilitate our IVIVE in this area. Ideally, we need more relevant in vitro data to verify this approach. There's no real relevant data at the moment. There's some interesting work that's coming out of Philadelphia. So Joe Bence's group is one such group that has um, published on this so far. Um, but really, I'm looking for further quantification of transporter abundances and membrane protein scalars um, to really make this model more robust. So that pretty much concludes it um, from us three here in uh, Sheffield. Um, we're happy to take any questions, so please feed that back. Um, and Wonderful. we'll also, uh, okay, I was just gonna hand over to Suzanne who will uh, possibly go through some of the polling questions as well um, to finalize. Thank you. Okay, thanks Matt. Um, we can certainly um, go back to, um, the polling questions and um, share the results if everyone's curious. So it looks like um, for absolute transporter abundances, the vast majority of folks are, are not measuring them. And it looks like the most useful addition to the skin model, people voted that it would be modeling in vitro skin permeation in the SIVA module for IVIVE. And it looks like the, the participants in this webinar work on a whole range of oncology programs with lung and leukemia and non-Hodgkin lymphoma being the most popular. We wanna encourage everybody to submit their questions to our speakers through the Q&A panel. Um, First question to our speakers is a question for Ali. Have you performed performance verification in the virtual cancer population with any cancer drugs? Okay, thanks, that's a great question. <clears throat> the, the, what we did for version 17, there was a, a parallel wish list item, which was looking at developing of additional compounds um, and included in them or were some cancer drugs, so paclitaxel and docetaxel. Um, so these compounds were developed um, alongside the uh, cancer population development. Uh, unfortunately, because it was parallel, we, we couldn't verify them uh, fully um, as uh, for the version 17 release, but they will be available in the members area. Um, but yes, the short answer is yes, we have looked at um, uh, different cancer drugs um, in the on oncology population. Thanks, Ollie. Um, looks like we've got a question for uh, for Nikunj. Is the skin model currently only for small molecule drugs? Um, yes, I think at the moment we are mainly focusing on small molecules. Um, but yeah, I think we are also looking for lymphatic absorption pathway, hopefully in future, and maybe making it available for large molecules. But large molecules are mainly uh, dosed as subcutaneous, not topical. So uh, I think there is some interest from micro needles, um, etc. So as, as I said, you know that that is uh, one of the potential areas that we could expand depending on the interest and depending on the. Uh, availability of the funding, but not at the moment. At the moment, it's mainly small molecules. Thanks, Nikunj. Uh, I've got a question from our audience for Matt. Could you explain again why combining absolute and relative scaling approaches, for, uh, why, why you combine the absolute and relative scaling approaches for transporters? 
Okay, well, I suppose that's got two arms to it, really. You can select either the relative expression factor approach, which is distinct from the ICFT approach, and they will be run through separately. They, they're based on completely different algorithms and completely different inputs, so you can do that. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the meta-analysis, um, what we wanted to do was, um, first of all, is, is look at the absolute abundance data. Um, and although there is some data around, I think we found around about uh, eight to ten studies. Some of them could not be included. Uh, we had exclusion criteria applied. So what we wanted to do was um, we, we would obtain the absolute abundances um, for each segment that we could do for a given transport, and then we'd supplement that with relative expression data that would give us more robustness in terms of the regional expression, and then we'd apply those together where we could to give us a more robust handle for the regional distribution, but still retaining some of the absolute abundant scaling, as I showed via the scaling of the Judgen and one. So really for us, it was a, a means of um, enabling more robust scalars in certain regions where we didn't have lots and lots of data, and we didn't want one or two studies to bias that particular value. So we went into the literature and looked at the relative expression analyses. So um, I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Matt. We have a question for Nick Kunj. Has the SIMSIP dermal model been used for regulatory submissions? Oh, that's um, uh, yeah, quite interesting question. Um, um, for the regulatory submission, I think, um, as far as I know, there are at least three examples at the moment that people are working on. I think they are either submitted or they are going to submit it to regulators, but I don't know if we have any um, responses on them yet. But yeah, I think it is one of the modules that is already being used um, for uh, addressing some of the uh, regulatory or drug development questions in, uh, by, the, um, by the pharma industry. Nikunj, I have another question for you. How can a small topical focused company access the SIMSIP dermal model? Um, so, yeah, I think for majority of the people, it is uh, they are aware that SIMSIP is uh, uh, based on a consortium uh, model. So basically, to access SIMSIP simulator, the company has to be part of consortium. Uh, but basically, it's not always the case for small small, uh, small companies. Um, so the way they could access is that we have introduced a new product called SimSip Access. Um, so there are some eligibility criteria that people can use if they qualify for them, or they could use the consultancy services. I think we found consultancy services are uh, more useful just to start with, and then once they realize how to use it and what benefits are there, they could either go for SimSip access or maybe they could join the SimSip consortium uh, to get the full access. Thanks, Nick. I've got a question from Matt. There's been recent data published showing that there's a threefold loss of protein when fractionating for liver tissue. Have you considered these losses in your meta analysis? Um, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of technical um, uh, complexity surrounding the measurement of absolute abundances and what absolute actually means. Um, I, I published a paper about three or four years ago in DMD um, broaching the subject of procedural losses um, when you centrifuge or you fractionate from a whole lysate down to a, a membrane fraction. Um, and the University of Washington have done some really nice analyses on this, so Bagwat Prasad's group. Um, basically, we, we didn't have sufficient um, data in this particular data set to do that, which um, basically means that I think we, we could well be under-predicting by a certain amount of abundance within those meta-analyses, but you can't just start ramping up abundances just like that for given studies without having the right kind of data. So I think in time, hopefully, as uh, the field becomes more aware that you have to account for losses, then we will incorporate these as, as the data becomes available into the simulator. 
Thanks, Matt. We've got a couple questions for you, Nick Kunj. Uh, first question, is there any specific reason why you observed large variability in exposure, AUC, from the lo low dose in the case study for the skin model? Okay, um, I guess this is a case study number one. Um, so um, at the moment, I think, as I said, Tariq is uh, looking into it, but there are a couple of uh, potential um, reasons why we have this over prediction at the lower dose. Um, one of them is probably because rivastigmine has a non-saturable clearance, while at the moment we are using the um, uh, first order clearance or just the total plasma clearance. So maybe better characterization of clearance would allow us to have this dose-dependent effect. Um, the second could be that um, uh, th there is something of the excipient effect because when the path is applied for a longer time on the skin, that, that could have some influence on the modification of skin physiology. Um, so at the moment we do not have a clear answer, but I think we are uh, looking into it so that why uh, we have different prediction or different accuracy of prediction at different doses. Thanks, Nikunj. The, the next question is, uh, besides predicting absorption parameters from, from drug physiochemical properties, have you tried using those from in vitro permeability studies? Um, yes, and I think basically that was one of the reasons we put that in the poll question, because I think we also found, and also independently from some other groups, that uh, using the in vitro permeability data to, to get the relevant parameters and then putting into the simulator improves prediction significantly as compared to some of the QSARs, because QRSAR models are there and uh, when you don't have data. I think they are quite beneficial, but they carry a lot amount of uncertainty because obviously you are trying to predict a lot many from just chemical structure. So I think where possible, if you have in vitro data and using it to parameterize the model, I think as far as we know has led to improvement in the predictions. Um, and obviously the aim is to provide a, a user-friendly tool within SIVA, SIM, SIVA platform, SIMSIP in vitro data analysis toolkit, so that user could do their modeling and then uh, have a seamless transition to SIMSIP for better in vitro in vivo extrapolation. Thanks, Nick Um Matt, I have a question for you. Did you find differences in regional expression when comparing the absolute and relative expression quantification for any transporters? Okay, yes. Um, for the main part, there was reasonable agreement in terms of the regional expression between the different uh, gut regions, um, if taking RT-PCR Western blotting versus absolute abundance. Um, one particular transporter that's a little bit tricky, and I did mention it very briefly in the uh, slides, is the ileal bile acid transporter, which does show a large regional variability. Um, when we did our absolute abundance analysis, the ileal bile acid transporter was approximately a hundredfold higher expression in the terminal ileum versus the jejunum. But when we looked at studies that were measuring via RT-PCR, for example, this difference is only 20-fold higher in the terminal ileum. Um, we're not too sure as to the exact reasons why that difference occurs. It could be that the data from the absolute abundance studies was quite close uh, to the limits of quantification. Uh, in, the, in the proximal regions such as the jejunum. And if they're slightly um, off in terms, of the, um, in terms of the measurement, then that can lead to big change, big fold changes. So, so that, that could be one aspect. Um, but ultimately, for, for the majority of the transporters, it was uh, quite encouraging that they were both, uh, both predicting reasonably well for the regional distribution. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Nick, Nick Hunch, I have a few more questions uh, for you, and then we'll be wrapping up our presentation. Someone wants to know if SIMSIP will provide guidance or recommendations as to which prediction models to use for each parameter where multiple models are available. 
Um, I think, yeah, that's a very, very good question and very relevant because I think for the people who are not aware, we have provided more than one QSAR models for um, some of the parameters. So one parameter could be predicted from multiple QSAR models that mostly we collected from literature. Um, I think each of these QSAR models sometimes could give you significantly different answers. At the moment, we do not have a... Um, uh, strong recommendation, uh, but we provided the one which we believe are uh, more uh, uh, re more suitable by default. So all the default models are uh, there uh, as a preferred from meritorious point of view, but I think we are doing uh, significant performance verification, so we might be come up with some way of recommendation to see where the which model works better, etc. But I think it's it's in the it's in the it's in the progress. We haven't got to that yet, but maybe next year we we might have something more to say. Nikins, this looks to be the last question from our audience. Are there any offerings for ocular delivery systems in the SimSip simulator? Um. I think at the moment we don't have any ocular offering, but uh, SimSip is part of this um, uh, multi-year research grant under Horizon 2020 from European Union, where SimSip is partnering with uh, well-known academic centers of excellence in ocular drug delivery and um, industrial partners, pharma companies, etc. So uh, there will be really uh, soon something coming out on ocular so please uh, keep watching and there might be more to share with you in, in terms of ocular drug delivery systems. Thanks, Nikunj. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, Matt, Nikunj, and Ali, for this highly educational presentation and also our audience for a lively and, and interesting Q&A 